We have graduated to Romans 6. Yeah, we should celebrate that. We're slowly inching our way through the book of Romans. And, uh, and I want to begin with a quick recap of what we've been so far and where we're going. So in Romans 1 through 5, Romans 1 through 5, go ahead and put up that, that first slide today. Romans 1 through 5 is about what God has accomplished for us in the gospel. And that's what we've been spending our time. We've taken the last 17 weeks just to unpack five chapters of Romans 1 through 5. And now we're going to take the next three to five years to unpack Romans 6 through 8. And and so now we're going to focus on what God will accomplish in us through the gospel. And I want to introduce Romans 6 to us today by just reading the first Six verses of Romans 6. It says this. Paul begins with another rhetorical question. He's anticipating some of these questions, right? It's a letter. So he's having a conversation almost like, hey, I'm anticipating that you're going to have some questions about this. But he says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Paul's like, what? That's crazy. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, you joined him in his death. For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Verse 5, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That is the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. Paul is such a great teacher that he's anticipating that they're going to have some questions because at the end of Romans 5, he says, where where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so he's thinking, some of you guys might take this the wrong way and thinking that grace is a license to just continue sinning because God will continue to give his grace. Paul is like, no, that's crazy. That means you never understood the grace of God in the first place. Right? Because you would not continue to live in sin if you have truly understood the power of God's grace. Right? That's basically an ignorant understanding of grace if you continue to live the same way. Can you say amen? See, my friends, he's saying, listen, the grace has accomplished the supernatural thing in your life where you're no longer a slave to the old ways of living. You are now alive in Christ. I think I've shared this before. If grace and sin got into a UFC match, grace would beat the crap out of sin any day of the week. And I repent to my wife for saying crap. I keep saying crap. But you get my point. Like, listen, it's not even a debate. You are dead to sin. Here's the thing, right? Dead things don't do dead things anymore. It's dead. It's a new reality in Jesus. It's to become alive as a new person that has been transformed from the inside out. Paul says this to the Christians in another place called Colossians. He he tells the Christians in in Colossians, he says this, he says, look, let me put it this way. Since you have been raised to, what's that word there? Come on, say it like you you mean it. So you've been raised to? Great name for a church, by the way. But with Christ, set your sights on the realities of? A new reality of living, right? Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you, come on dead people, for you, die to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Can you say amen? And so we were joined with Christ in this new life. Now, this is a mystical experience because because the Spirit of God comes and indwells the believer and what happened to Christ translates into the believer's life. That's a mystical thing. Only when you've experienced that reality you'll know what I'm talking about. It's one thing to say Christ, you know, died and rose again. It's another thing to not say Christ, no, Christ in me. Christ in me, Like, like this reality is my reality, right? That when Jesus died, I died. When Jesus was buried, I was buried. 
When Jesus was rose to new life, I was rose to new life. That is what Paul is actually saying this. And to illustrate his point, he says, this is a baptism. This is what baptism is all about. Now notice something here. He never mentioned water. Notice that he's talking about baptism in Christ, but he doesn't mention water baptism. Why? Because before you can have a water baptism, you need to have a spiritual baptism. Because if you don't have a spiritual baptism where that is a true thing that's happened on the inside of you, when you go through the waters, it doesn't do anything by giving you a public shower. It's, it's just a public bath. If there's no internal transformation, then there's nothing for you to be able to testify to. Going through the water is to testify about the reality that Jesus has changed you from the inside out. That's only a physical manifestation of the spiritual reality that you have experienced with Christ. I have died, I've been buried, and I've been rose again to new life. Can you say amen? So the old sinful self, he says, was crucified with Christ. And what he's saying is sin has lost his power over the believer. We are no longer slaves to sin. We have a new master, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, the question that I want us to wrestle with for a little bit this morning is, if that's true, right, why is it so hard to stop sinning? If that's true, that I, that I have been dead, buried, and alive in Christ, why do I have a hard time with sin? I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> I, I, I want to I unpack this for a little bit, and we're going to unpack this for the next, you know, several weeks to come, because 6 through 8 is all about this wrestling match that we find ourselves in. In Romans 7, he gets even more detail. He's like, man, why is it that the things I want to do, I don't do? The things that I want to do, end up doing? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? I thank God that there's a Jesus <laughs> that can get me out of this conundrum that I find myself in. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That struggle. So, to illustrate this, I... You know, my mind is weird. I, I think about weird things when I'm studying. But this brought me back to a movie from the 80s. I'm going to show my age a little bit here. Some of you guys will, will relate to this. But in, by the way, I don't recommend this movie at all. It's the 80s. You can't expect much. Listen, millennials, Gen Z, the 80s was like this really obscure decade that took place. Right? And it had some really obscure movies. But this was a funny comedy. It's really dumb. But... It's a comedy called, and if you know it, please respond. It's called, let me just show it to you. It, it's this movie right here. Weekend <laughs> of Birdies. How many are familiar with Weekend of Birdies? Oh, I'm talking to the right people. Okay, Gen Z, millennials, let me explain this to you. Weekend of Birdies is this really dumb comedy, right, about these two guys. They, they work for this insurance company, and they work for their boss. Their boss's name is Bernie, right? And so... They are working and they want to they wanna climb the, the ladder of, of the corporation and they found this discrepancy in the books and they got excited because they're like, man, we found something here, we're going to take it to the boss and we're going to get promoted. So they take it to their boss, Bernie, and say, look, we found this, this is crazy discrepancy, something's going on, not realizing that it was actually Bernie that was cooking the books. So they brought it to their boss thinking like we're going to get promoted. The boss lied to them and said, hey, come to my house this week and we're going to celebrate, but Behind the scenes, Bernie was actually orchestrating for the mafia to kill these guys. I know, it's, it's the 80s. Okay? And so they go to Bernie's house, but here's the thing. The, the plot twist is the mafia decides we're going to kill Bernie instead. Because Bernie's getting sloppy and we need to get rid of him. So they get to Bernie's house and Bernie is dead. He's dead on his couch and now they're like, we're the only two people here. They're going to blame this on us, so what do we do? And as they're trying to figure out what to do, people begin to show up because it's a party at Bernie's house, and so they decided the best thing to do is to act like Bernie's still alive. And so for the whole weekend, they carry Bernie's body around and pretend that he's really alive. I know, it's really dumb, I told you. <laughs> but here's, here's why this, this really like brought... Bernie back to my mind is the fact that here they are walking around with a body that is dead. And if it's dead, it can't do anything anymore. 
<laughs> See, I don't, I don't think you understand what I'm trying to say is that here you are walking around with something dead, but you don't owe any favors to that dead thing anymore because it's dead. <laughs> dead things can't do anything anymore. We all have an old sinful self that we drag around yeah. everywhere. But guess what? Jesus says now you have a choice. Before you had no choice. Before you just did what your old sinful self wanted to do because all you knew was the old you. Now you have a choice. Now Jesus is like, man, I have come and given you life. And so when you see that dead thing, try to make you do dead things, you have a choice to say, no, 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 I'm no longer that dead thing. I'm a new person in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. I don't have to respond to Bernie. <laughs> There's a Bernie in you. You don't have to obey the old self. Jesus has given us power over the old self. Paul puts it this way. He illustrates it this way when he's speaking to a group of Christians in a city called Galatia. He says it this way in Galatians. Go ahead. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why now you have power over the old because you can tell the old, man, we dead. We alive now in Christ. We don't have to do what we used to do. Thank God I'm not who I used to be. I may not be there yet, but I'm on my way because I've been crucified with Christ. So here's another way to ask this question. Have you truly died to the old self? Because that's the dilemma, right? That the problem is, a lot of times, my friends, the struggle is that the old is still kicking around. See, here's the struggle that a lot of people are having, and I'm seeing this a lot in our society, is that we're approaching Christianity like it's going to the chiropractor. See, a lot of people think, like, you know, I'm pretty good, I just need a little adjustment. You know, if I just get a little tweak in my life, if I just get the right person in my life, if I just get the right job, if I just get the right thing, and we just think, listen, just, just Jesus, just, just, you know, just fix me a little bit and I'll be all right. That's the problem. The problem is you haven't died yet. Jesus is not your chiropractor. Jesus is Lord and Savior. Unless he becomes Lord of your life, he's not Lord at all. Right? You can't be running your life and asking Jesus to bless it. A lot of people think Jesus is their chiropractor, like he's their, he's their personal guru. <laughs> you know, like, like that, that's what I'm seeing in our society. What we're doing in our society is, is called syncretism. We're taking a little bit of the things we like and we're throwing away the things we don't like and we're trying to build a better life. The problem is you will never live a better life until you die. Yeah. Yeah. Christianity is about dying in order to live. Christianity is about rebelling against your old nature. Christianity is saying, I will no longer be a slave to my old self. It's a rebellion. It's not an adjustment. See, a lot of people are just still trying to adjust to an old life. You cannot have new wine in old wineskin, Jesus says. Something's got to give. The old must go for the new to come. Are you tracking with me? Here's another way to ask this question. How do you know you actually died to the old self? How do you actually know? It's very simple. It's very simple. You, you ready? You know you've died to the old self when you love Jesus more than you love your sin. Let me say it again. You know you've died to the old self when you love Jesus when you, more than you love your sin. See, see, you're either pregnant or you're not. You can't be kind of pregnant. Right? My wife has been pregnant five times, right? We have five beautiful kids. But here's the thing. Pregnancy is interesting because pregnancy is, is a person given room in their body for a new person. Right? And in that, in that process, there, there are moments where a pregnant woman would have certain cravings. And it's just weird. Like it could be one in the morning, she's like, I want hot dog. I'm like, 
hot, oh, we're gonna get hot dog at one o'clock in the morning. But why though? Because there's a new person growing on the inside of her and her body's trying to make sense of it, trying to make room for it. And when you are being born again, it comes with new cravings. You are not born again unless you have cravings. What are those cravings? You have more of a craving to serve Jesus than to serve your sin. You have more cravings to read the word than, than to be led by the world. You have more cravings to pray than you have to complain. You have more cravings to serve than to actually receive. My friends, you don't know you've been born again unless your cravings has changed. Because there's a new person that has been born on the inside of you. Can you say again, born again, people have born again cravings. 25 years ago, my cravings changed. I was a 20-year-old, and I could summarize my life in three things quickly. If you would ask that 20-year-old who had hair back then, what life was about, it, it was simple. It was sports, girls, party. It's that simple. And you're like, pastor? Yes, yeah, you're a pastor. I wasn't born a pastor. Hello. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me. But you know, when Jesus came into my life, my cravings change. All of a sudden, my friends, I couldn't get enough of this. I couldn't stop eating this. I couldn't stop reading this. Every single day, I find myself doing this. On the weekends, when my friends would go clubbing, I would go to Jesus. It was Jesus. It was his word. It was his truth. It was his righteousness. Why? Because when you meet Jesus, your cravings change. Dead people don't crave things that are alive. New people crave life. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. There's a craving that comes with knowing Jesus. By the way, 25 years ago, I remember coming back from this, from this retreat, man, I was fired up. I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. I just remember telling my boys, like, yo, like, something happened to me. This Jesus is real, man. He's, he's changing my life. And they're like, dude. You know, dead people, dude. <laughs> I'll give you a couple of weeks, man. You went to that church thing. You got excited. I don't know about you. It hasn't been a couple of weeks. It's been 25 years. And it's still a craving to know this Jesus. Do you crave the word or do you crave the world? That's how you know. Do you crave prayer or do you crave gossiping? Do you crave serving or do you crave people to keep serving you? Like these are the things that will show you if you're truly born again. Do not get it twisted. You either have Jesus as Lord or he's your chiropractor. But if you have him as Lord, he can be your chiropractor. <laughs> you didn't get that one. You get that tomorrow. When, listen, when an unbeliever sins, it's natural. It's just what he does. It's his identity. 25 years ago, if you would ask me about that, I'd be like, what do you mean? I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah. That's how dead people talk. We talk in the negative. You want to know if you're born again? Do you focus on what you're not doing wrong or do you focus on what you're doing right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's about the cravings. It changes you from the inside out. If those cravings are not real, you can go through the waters of baptism and still go back to the same old life. But if the cravings are real, you go through the waters of baptism to testify about the fact that he has changed you from the inside out. Come hell or high water, my mind's made up. It's Jesus and his will for my life. When a believer sins, is unnatural. Do you want to know if you're born again when you sin? Do you feel guilty? You should. You know why? The guilt is telling you that ain't you anymore. That's not you anymore. Like, I, I didn't create you for that. I create you for this. I create you for righteousness. I created you for holiness. I created you for sanctification. I created you for healing. I created you for purpose. I created you to have life and life more abundant. That's why a believer is quick to repent because he doesn't feel right anymore. An unbeliever will say, well, I'm not perfect. Yeah, duh. You're just not dead yet. When a believer sins, it goes against his own nature. That's why it feels weird. Like once you have no Jesus, man, it's a weird place to be because you no longer belong in the world. And, 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 and if you don't continue to grow in him, then you will always feel out of place. 
Because you desire Him. You long for Him. You want to know if you're truly born again? Simple. Things that matter becomes things that you want to, not have to. We have a saying in this church, we get to do this. We don't have to. That's how our life people talk. I get to worship. I get to pray. I get to serve. I get to give. I get to serve God. Not, oh, I'm trying to think I'm. Come on, Bernie. <laughs> Come on, Bernie. Let's take you to church. You know what's interesting? When, when the craving is real, it's real anywhere. I had an interesting thing this week, right? I'm leaving the office to go get lunch, and this group of people were walking by. I didn't even know they knew me. By the way, it's not, listen, don't get it twisted. There's a lot of people in this church. If I don't recognize you, don't get mad. There's a lot of you. <laughs> right? They're walking by. I don't even know what they were talking about. And one of them went, oh, sorry, pastor, about the language. <laughs> you know, the punk in me wanted to be like, you know. <laughs> but here's my point. New people have new vocabulary no matter where you are. So it's not about the pastor being in a room. It's about what's in your heart that comes out of you. Because if you're new, you're new at the gym, you're new at Shaw's, you're new at Stop and Shop, you're new at Gold's Gym, you're new at Facebook, you're new at 2 in the morning, you're new at 2 in the afternoon. There's a new you, and it doesn't change. That's why when I meet people, I don't tell them I'm a pastor, people get weird. I say it. I do insurance. <laughs> Life insurance. Yeah. I work for Bernie. Because <laughs> people get weird on you thinking that it's something that you put on. You don't put it on. It's either you are or you're not. Yeah. One time I was in California on a church conference. You know, the Uber guy is driving us around and he's, man, <laughs> he's doing his thing. You know. And then somehow we got to the conversation of why we were in town, and he found out I'm a pastor. Man, his vocabulary just shifted. I was like, this man just had a born-again experience in this Uber. <laughs> Here's my friend. My point is, when you have it, you can't fake the funk. It's either you have it or you don't. Are you born again? Has your cravings changed? Do you love Jesus? Do you love his word? Do you love his church? Do you love his truth? Then give him some praise. That's why I love that it just happened that we started Romans 6 on Celebration Sunday. It's like God winking at us. Saying, let let me give you a live illustration of what it looks like. We're going to have some friends going through the water of the baptism saying what? This Jesus has come. And I love the immersion baptism because that's what Paul says, by the way. He says, it's it's, it's a death. right? Like you're going down, right, to be buried and then to come back alive to a new life, right? It's not, it's not, this is why we don't baptize babies. There'll be, like, child abuse to <laughs> put a, and we don't sprinkle neither, that's also weird, like, because a baby hasn't taken ownership. What's he gonna say? Oh, Mom, I'm sorry I burped on you and <laughs> gave you a hard time in the womb. No, you have to come to a realization of your reality that I need a savior and his name is Jesus. I don't need a chiropractor. I don't need a fixing. I need a transformation that can only take place from the inside out. Babies can't be transformed yet. I'm not going to get into war theology with you, but this is what I love about doing it, that adults are willingly saying the old is gone and the new has come and his name is Jesus. He's the author and savior of my faith. My friends, the Holy Spirit comes to identify you with Jesus. My friends, when you come to the waters today, it's only real, it's already happening in you. This is just a public declaration of a spiritual reality. This is a physical understanding of a spiritual reality. That what you have is eternally yours. No one can take that away from you. See, for 25 years, I've seen a lot of these And unfortunately, I've seen a lot of come and go because it wasn't a real, truly born-again experience. It was a ritual. But when it's a really born-again experience, then the ritual matches the reality and the heavens rejoices and says, here's another one who is giving their true lives to Jesus. 
So I leave you with Paul's words from Romans chapter 10 about this reality. Paul says this is what happens when you're ready to die so that you can live. He says, look, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and be- Lord, not chiropractor. You know what Lord is? Boss. Dead people don't tell God how to run their lives. Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved from whom? You. (laughs) You're the problem. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Today, they're going to openly declare that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And the Bible says you overcome by the word of your testimony. But you don't have a testimony unless you go through a test. And you know what's going to happen? All hell's going to break loose because you made a public declaration that Jesus is your Lord. And here's the key. You may go through hell, but you don't stop. You go through it. You want to know if you're born again? Have you gone through some stuff, but you didn't give up because it's too good? That's when you know. Jesus is truly the Lord of my life. Bow your heads with me as we pray today. Why do we bow our heads and close our eyes? To mind our business and to take ownership. Don't let this thing just be a head knowledge. It has to go from your head to your heart. It has to be real. It has to transform you from the inside out. And if today you're like, man, that's me. I I want new cravings. I want Jesus. I want life. I've been approaching Jesus like he's my chiropractor. I need him to be my Lord and Savior. Take a moment today to give your life truly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where no longer you live, but Christ lives in you. So Holy Spirit, I pray you confirm your word in our hearts today. I pray right now, Lord, you are bringing conviction. You're bringing revelation. And you're birthing a new life in people's lives and if that's you you're like man you're talking to me pray this prayer with me open your mouth right now and confess Jesus as Lord say this prayer with me but you got to mean it. it's got to be for real it's got to be that man I, I'm, I'm ready to die to self so Christ may live in me I don't care if you've been to church before you can go to church and I know Jesus you need to know Jesus and then church becomes more relevant when you know Jesus pray this with me say Jesus I need you in my life I need you to forgive me my sins I need to die. Empower me to die to my old self so that I can live in you and through you. Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord and Savior of my life. Today, my life belongs to you. My future's in your hands. I have died to the old to come alive in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to live in the fullness of your will. And I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. 